delivered? The only reason I got around to finally watching Blonde was because it was panned by audiences, and because it was written and directed by Andrew Dominic, who directed Chopper, which is a film that I really like. If you go back and you read articles from before Blonde came out about Blonde, they all say that it's going to be a Marilyn Monroe biopic, and it's also going to be Netflix's first NC-17 rated film, and will therefore be full of sexy, simulated sexiness. For sex. By its frosty reception, I thought Blonde would be a sexploitation cash-in full of misogyny. Here, in this video, I am arguing that Blonde is actually a masterpiece, and is not unlike Chopper in what it is doing, and like Chopper, is easily misinterpreted as celebrating what it is in fact criticising. Very important to note is that the film is not a biopic. It is a fictionalised telling of some of Marilyn Monroe's life, presented as a surreal psychological horror that reads to me as an attack on 40s and 50s Hollywood, and by extension contemporary Hollywood, the force and finesse of which might not have been realised since Sunset Boulevard. To me, Blonde is about trauma and how we carry it through our lives, how it colours and distorts every experience after. It's about a lot of things. So, here we go. Blonde. Narcissism. Exploitation. Paranoia. A boo boo ba doo. A doo ba doo. A woo ba da schna. This waba is Frenchie. That thing up on the screen, it is me. For this particular video, I'm at first going to go through the film chronologically, although briefly, so expect spoilers, in case you didn't know that at the end Marilyn Monroe goes on to lead a happy life and is still alive and a total babe to this day. As I said, it's really important to note that Blonde is not a biopic. It really offers an alternate worldview of Marilyn Monroe, and it isn't really about her, but rather her myth and subverting that myth. The film is based on a best-selling novel from 2000 by Joyce Carol Oates. Andrew Dominic, who wrote and directed the film, read the book and reportedly appreciated it to the point of obsession, reading biographies of Marilyn Monroe, speaking with people who knew her, visiting places where she lived, but he stresses that just as the book isn't really a biography at all, his film isn't really an adaptation of Oates's book. Rather, her book was what inspired him and formed the linchpin of the project. And what a project! In some form of production since at least 2010, when Naomi Watts was set to star, it took Dominic rubbing shoulders with Brad Pitt, who he worked with on The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward John Ford, and Killing Them Softly, before he could get this made. Pitt is one of the producers of Blonde. From the credits, the film clearly hints as to what it's about. The bright lights, the darkness behind them, the dust inside them. As with many moments in the rest of the film, there is double meaning. So the film, not a biopic, starts with Norma Jean, aka Marilyn Monroe, although I'll refer to the movie character as Norma Jean, as a child. Her father is absent, and even his name is unknown to her. Her mother is abusive, deluded, and otherwise mentally ill. Thematically important is her implying that Norma Jean's father is an important man in Hollywood, or simply, the industry. The opening has Norma Jean's mother make a bizarre attempt to reach Norma Jean's father, or perhaps someone both mother and daughter wish were Norma Jean's father. Then, in a fit of rage, Norma Jean's mother attempts to drown her. 
Concluding the opening, Norma Jean is dumped at a state orphanage. The opening is full of dread. More importantly than that, is that it establishes the core of what I think Blonde is about. Loneliness, and more specifically being stuck in your own head type loneliness. Dominic has said in interviews that with Blonde he was, in part, attempting to tell a story from inside someone's own mythology, which I interpret as inside their own head, not unlike Enter the Void or Dominic's own film Chopper. Part of that, surely, is unreliability, especially as the head we're inside is full of fear and delusion. This opening, however, comes across more as a memory more than later scenes do, as if we're not seeing what happened but what Norma Jean remembers happening. The later scenes seem a bit more fantastical, as if she's not just misremembering or skewering, but fantasizing or just tripping balls on the generous selection of 1950s party drugs. But also, the way the opening is handled almost hints at the idea that Marilyn Monroe is a figment of eight-year-old Norma Jean's imagination, and that the true ending might be that eight-year-old still cowering from her mother in the car. Obviously, that's not the case, but the dreamlike and even nauseous tone makes it clear that whether the scenes are real or imagined, the rest of the film will come back to this, childhood trauma. We never see Norma Jean's adolescence, we instead rejoin her at the birth of her career, and here we immediately get a great big dose of our next core idea, exploitation and compliance. Norma Jean confronts the price of her admission into Hollywood by not confronting it at all. Her unwillingness to truly see herself, as well as her vocalizing annoyance that people cannot separate Norma Jean from the character Marilyn Monroe, all serve not to make only a contradictory character, but a contradictory narrative, or narrator, if you think of the film as narrated by Norma Jean, but with unspoken thought rather than mouth words. As an example, she meets Charlie Chaplin Jr. and Edward G. Robinson Jr. And again, she lies to herself when she tells Chaplin Jr. she sees beyond his last name, then thinking of Charlie Chaplin's picture in her mother's house. Anyway, Norma Jean ends up in a thruple with Mac and Dennis, and I mean, why wouldn't you? They don't seem creepy at all. Then, she gets pregnant and visits her mad enough to be mad but sane enough to be a bitch mother, presumably comes to the conclusion that her baby is destined for the same madness and decides to have an abortion. Norma Jean has second thoughts in the car ride, no one listens to her, but then, here especially, the lines between reality and fantasy blur. My inference is that really, Blonde's Norma Jean chose to have that abortion and was never forced, but then, as she so often does, she lied and lies to herself about it on such a deep level that her nonsensical telling of this and other events is more pathological than deceitful. The lens through which this story is told is not only blurry, but also its own subject matter. So what really happens in the narrative is never really, truly clear. We follow glimpses of Norma Jean's career, where she is constantly fetishized and condescended to. Like a novel by Dostoevsky, where you feel sympathy for the criminal and don't wish to see her punished. Oh, you, you've read Dostoevsky, have you? <laughs> we see some of her marriage to Joe DiMaggio, how alien she is to a normal family, how willing she is to be whatever others want her to be, and how desperate she is for some sort of father figure and stability. But it isn't as simple as her having daddy issues, it's deeper than that. What she never had was unconditional love, someone who truly sees Norma Jean. 
Charlie Chaplin Jr. and Edward G. Robinson Jr., then blackmail DiMaggio. And honestly, if it was me, I'd have been over that table as soon as they started smirking. I'm not gonna wipe that look off your face, sunshine. I'm gonna wipe your face off your fucking head. Anyway, Norma Jean gets divorced from the physically abusive DiMaggio and gets married to the, in this portrayal at least, self-involved Arthur Miller, playwright, oh my. He too confuses Norma Jean with Marilyn Monroe, although perhaps he never really met Norma Jean. She gets pregnant again, miscarries, and has a massive protracted breakdown. Again, this is punctuated with vignettes of Norma Jean's career, all tied back to the central themes of exploitation and delusion, and how those things play into Norma Jean's life. She plays a character that has sex with producers to get acting parts, she sings about everyone needing a daddy, she is drooled over and sexualized, and although it's through her own compliance, the telling, not the directors, but the subjects, has it that these things were happening to her. Norma Jean's motives for pursuing fame, however, are never really clear beyond her impulses to find her daddy, or a daddy figure. Daddy. After getting a bit famous, she starts to receive letters apparently from her father, who gives her no way to contact him, but promises to visit her soon. And it's really this that gives her hope. There's a sense of inevitability all throughout, which of course goes hand in hand with dread, but also the themes of self-sabotage. We skip ahead to 1962, where a drugged up and ever anxious Norma Jean visits JFK, the third horniest president in US history. It isn't sexual between the president and me. It has very little to do with sex. She's hustled through a hotel and delivered to the president to service him like the object she is, which she does as he verbally abuses her and talks to someone on the phone about various sex scandals. Then it's implied that he rapes her. Then it's implied, in an utterly terrifying sequence that looks like it could have been from some forbidden Lady Gaga video, that the US government forcibly aborted the president's baby. Again, it's not really a comment on JFK, although it does not portray him as a particularly nice man, but rather, it's about being used, being meat, being idolized and famous and successful for allowing herself and her body to be exploited. Norma Jean more or less comes to this realization or begins to accept it and plunges further into mania and depression. She receives word that Charlie Chaplin Jr. has, very sadly, choked on his own vomit and died. And she learns that he was writing the letters from her father all along. She then kills herself, intentionally or not. Her death feels very cathartic, not just for the audience. It's very successful in making her suicide feel like a release, which I'd say is far more risky than even the dick shot. So I can see why this film can come across as exploitative and doing Marilyn dirty, but really, it's about exploitation, and I think it's really making a case that Marilyn Monroe is not someone to look up to. That's a ballsy thing to do in a film that very much looks like it's about Marilyn Monroe. But like I say, it's far more about Norma Jean than it is about her creation. But it isn't really about her either, rather the mythology of her. It's really about demolishing that mythology. As Dominic has said, what's more exploitative? Gentlemen prefer blondes about a woman having sex with people for material objects, or this film's portrayal of Norma Jean being raped by a real-life studio head Daryl F. Zanuck who in real life is credited as being the granddaddy of casting couch coercion. The film doesn't hate Norma Jean or Marilyn Monroe, but I'd argue that it hates and attacks what she represents. Industrialized misogyny so deeply ingrained, even today some people argue that Monroe is some sort of feminist icon. 
Yeah, sure. Just like Deep Throat was a feminist movie. It does this in part by using sumptuous and varied cinematography, even changing the aspect ratio in parts, and heavily references and recreates still photography of Monroe. But I think more importantly to its subversive efforts is that a great deal, really almost all, of the mythos of Monroe presented in the film is from the fantasies of Norma Jean herself. It's quite one tone in that it's a three hour movie where we're stuck in someone's head, the ultimate horror, but at the same time, it's very multi-layered. Norma Jean is selfish, childish, naive, but she also comes across quite sympathetically. She's not unkind, she's not stupid by any means, but she is broken. She's propelled by childhood trauma, but at the same time she exploits it, but at the same time as that, the film questions the inevitability of that and the conscientiousness of it. Norma Jean constantly wants to escape from Marilyn and the assumptions and I suppose judgment that comes with that. But really, her escape is Marilyn. Yes, this film got me thinking about things I had no idea I wanted to think about. I really like it for what it's about and the way it's told, but a huge part of that too is the various cinema techniques. The photography and the score are frankly brilliant. There's a huge variety of shots and angles that change in style and type without clear meaning, not unlike the 1968 film If. Most notable are changes in aspect ratio, lighting and sound, which you could spend years trying to figure out the meaning behind. Is it a dream when it's in 3x4? or in slow motion, or there are deep, rich blacks and incredible contrast. But not unlike if, these aesthetic changes don't always have direct meaning, but rather thematic meaning. The change in visuals in particular, because Dominic used the aspect ratios, colour and contrast levels of real life photos used as visual references. These variances go hand in hand with the sound design, which can suddenly but subtly change from non-diegetic to diegetic, contributing to the surreal feel but often creating a sense of loneliness and that we are indeed viewing the world through Norma Jean's eyes and thoughts only. Surreal transitions and layers of visual and audio distortion some as clear as the distortion of paparazzi faces, some as subtle as Norma Jean and Marilyn Monroe being shot differently and appearing to have different eye colour, work to connect the internal and external, and Norma Jean's present with her traumatic past. But I do understand that it's not everyone's cup of tea. It's pretty heavy, what with all the depression and rape. The CGI fetus which is definitely a fantasy of Norma Jean, isn't exactly something I'd consider palatable for a regular What's on Netflix Today audience, and I don't think it serves as a comment on abortion. But still, want to get an audience scared? Talking fetuses is always the way to do it. Saying that, I think the nudity is totally warranted and is there for a reason. Not only do I think that yes, Norma Jean probably would occasionally walk around her own home naked, but it's also about vulnerability and being or feeling exposed. There's a lot of nudity in Blonde, quite a bit of sex, but it's the opposite of erotic. In the same way, the film doesn't exploit Marilyn Monroe's long dead, long exploited myth. It's about that myth, and the Norma Jean Marilyn Monroe hybrid isn't exploited or infantilized by the movie, but rather by its characters. We see scenes throughout of Norma trying to stand up for herself, being a pretty good actor, but being talked down to, used, and being both revered and pigeonholed by everyone around her. I think some of the negative reaction, which Dominic says himself is tilted toward American general audiences, comes down to the fact that this is not a mainstream movie, with a clear beginning, middle and end, with clear antagonists and heroes. Sure, 
I might sound like I've got my head up my ass, but this isn't the type of movie you can just sit down with with a trash bag of popcorn and enjoy without some cinema literacy. I think the marketing from Netflix kind of is a bit to blame for that. It's not a fun watch, it's a living nightmare. Huzzah! Do you want the truth, or do you want some candy-flavoured plastic rope? I've heard some people say that the film is lewd. Certainly some of its characters are lewd. Is the film lewd? The people running Hollywood then and the people running Hollywood now are lewd. Get a grip. I can't help but think Blonde's nomination for a Razzie was a way for Hollywood, which obviously, really, controls the Razzies. Not officially, but really. To rebuke Dominic for highlighting what Hollywood is and always was about, and to show how utterly disgusting the golden age of Hollywood really was. Again, think of the masters of Hollywood right now. When they were just starting, it was completely normal to cast someone by fucking them. I'm quite surprised and honestly low-key impressed that Netflix funded this and allowed Dominic to make it without interference. They must have known that, even at $22 million, Blonde would perform for them as a loss leader at best. But maybe that doesn't matter in the streaming wars anyway. I think it's interesting too, that there are so many thematic similarities between Dominic's first film, Chopper, and Blonde. The narrator, if you think of the narrative impetus that way, in both films, is self-aggrandizing, deluded, and terribly unreliable, while also allowing us to deeply sympathize with them. Chopper and Norma Jean in these films are both shaped into being what they are and into trying to appear to be what they perceive others want them to be because of what happened to them as children. Chopper, I think, is really well done. It could be the film a director makes at the end of their career, not the start of it, and yet, Blonde is so much more sophisticated in its examination of the same themes as Chopper. It really gives me hope for the future of film, that people like Dominic are doing things like this, with this level of exposure. So let me cap it off by saying, as a amateur, a very amateur filmmaker, um, to me this is what Dominic did. He made a real piece of art with a tremendous amount of shit to say that he wanted to say, uh, not because it aligned with a job offer. He was trying to make this for more than 10 years. This is what he wanted to make. And he made it, and he did not compromise on it. Not that it really matters in this situation, but he lost the studio money, and he alienated uh, vast swathes of audiences across the globe, but especially in America. The trifecta! That is what I aspire to in my wildest dreams. Well done, Dominic. Well done. So that's it. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Why not leave a comment? Why leave a comment? Why watch? Why get out of bed? Mm. I have a Patreon, uh, which I run, uh, you know, so you can give me money for virtually nothing in return. That's the way the world works now, isn't it? Uh, but I'd rather do that than, you know, Try and sell you some beans or something. Put in like a space right in the middle of a sentence, you know, so there's like G Fuel, buy some G Fuel. Uh, so, you know, I appreciate that. Uh, Twitter, um, Facebook, you know, if you've got any leads, anything interesting to say, any pictures you've drawn, there you go. All right, thanks very much. Take it easy, or don't, I don't care, whatever. See you next time. Or not. I don't know. Bye.